Welcome to Orange Tofu Banana Hammock, the easy way to enjoy podcasts, online videos, and photography. Before kids matured enough to call you a faggot, they called you a sissy. Here's four stories about sissies from the December 13th, 1996 episode from the granddaddy of all podcasts, This American Life. From PRI Public Radio International. From PRI Public Radio International. From PRI Public Radio International. Public Radio. Public Radio International. Radio International. One more time. What could be more horrible than the moment when you realize that everybody in the world can see some aspect of you, something about you, that you never even knew that you were revealing, that you didn't want to reveal? So Mubarak was at a track meet. This is back in high school. He was at this track meet, and he's setting up those um, runner's blocks, you know, you use in track. And I was, you know, sort of pampering my blocks, moving the blocks back and forth, like ever so slightly hair lengths, you know, testing out how they felt and standing up and putting my hands on my hip and, you know, putting my finger on my cheek and looking at it as if I was in deep thought and, like, bending down and probably even, like, dusting off the blocks and... What I didn't know at the time was there was the whole group of track members from the opposing team who were standing watching me and and laughing. They were like, you know, this big sissy is what they're putting up for us to beat. Remember, please, high school, high school, where in the hierarchy of put-downs, the worst thing you could call a boy was sissy. Mubarak won his match. And the coach came up after I won, and he actually gave me this big hug. And he was like, that was great. And I was like, you know, thanks. But my time wasn't anything particularly better than before. So I kind of had this puzzled look in his face. He's like, that was great the way you know, act like the way you like psych those guys out by acting like a big sissy in front of your blocks and, and then like showing them. And as soon as he said that, it hit me like, what had happened? And I was like, you know, you know, I played along. Yeah, hey, well, good thing I thought of that. <laughs> Welcome to WBEZ Chicago. It's This American Life. I'm Ira Glass. Today on our program, sissies, weak ones, defiant ones, brave ones, and the ones who do not even know they are sissy. Act 1, Anti-Oedipus. Act 2, Instructions for Sissies. Act 3, The Pansy Kings Sing Songs of Love. Act 4, Syndicated Columnist Dan Savage answers the question, Who loves a sissy? He does. Stay with us. Act 1. Well, the tragedy of the story of Oedipus if you remember this from school, is that a son kills his father and marries his mother. And then, um, of course, rips out his eyes when he realizes what it is that he's done. And the thing about the story is that um, he does all these things unwittingly. He doesn't know that that's what he's doing with his mother and father when he does it. Well, the first story in today's program is also about a family that ends up getting ripped apart. It's also about a family where the son ends up with the mother, the father gone, and it's also a story where the tragedy of it is that it all happens without any of them really wanting it to happen this way. It's the ending they all wanted to avoid. Nancy Updike prepared the story of an American family and of what it means to be a man. This story is like one of those Russian dolls where there's always a smaller one inside. The smallest doll, the core of the drama, is the fact that Mubarak, a childhood sissy, grew up to be a different kind of sissy than his father. His father is nerdy and bookish. Mubarak's gay. Everything around that core gets bigger and bigger until finally you can't believe the biggest and the smallest have anything to do with each other. The one is so bloated and the other so tiny. At the beginning of this story, Mubarak's parents are married and in love and both prepare to live far from everything they know to be with each other. At the end of the story, they may still be in love, but they're divorced and an ocean apart, and not speaking. 
and Mubarak is caring for his mother the way a husband might. Okay, Margie Ruth. I don't get too hot. I'm not too good, too hot. Mubarak starts Margie's shower, and he's holding on to her so she won't fall, and she's holding on to him, too. She's about five feet tall, naked and fragile-looking, and very pale. He's dressed in jeans and a shirt that he knows are about to get really wet. All right, lift your breast. Lift one at a time so I can wash under it. Okay. Hey, Margie, was it hard the first time Mubarak gave you a shower? I got embarrassed. How did, how did you get over being embarrassed? I just called it happens over and over and over again. Mark, it's my son, you know. He gets a washcloth in under her breasts, and she stands serenely, blinking in the water. It's a moment so intimate it's hard to watch. But then, as he gets her out of the shower and is drying her off, there's another moment that makes the intimacy of everything before it seem completely beside the point and prettied up in comparison. He takes a baby wipe and wipes her butt for her. Nobody's going to give me a shot today, are they? No, we have to take some blood, though. We have to go to the lab, and they're going to have to take some blood. Well, that's a shot. It's, it's not a shot. They're drawing yeah. blood. Well, they, they, put they stick, stick you, but they're not giving you a shot. They're taking blood. There's a difference. You ever tried it? <laughs> Margie's only 66, but in the last couple of years, she's had a heart attack and two small strokes, which paralyzed her right arm and affected her memory. It cuts in and out like faulty wiring. Sometimes she's talkative and remembers a lot. Sometimes she's not, and she doesn't. Here, you know what? Lift your breast for me again so that we can make sure. You don't have a rash under there anymore, do you? I don't think so. Because we've got to make sure it stays dry so it doesn't get a rash under there. Mubarak, is this closer than you ever thought you'd get to an adult woman's body? <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could say that. But this is the end of the story. This is today. Let's go back to the beginning. Mubarak's family didn't really notice that he was, as he tells it, a big sissy because they were all oddballs. No matter where they were living, at least one of them was always not quite fitting in. Margie's from Georgia and lived most of her married life either up north or in the Middle East. Mubarak's father, Saber, is Palestinian, born in Jordan, but for most of the marriage they all lived in a small town in Pennsylvania where he was a professor of civil engineering. Now, if Mubarak was a sissy and white, working-class, Catholic, Hershey PA, Saber was, too. We got a week off of school every year because so many people, so many boys, went hunting, went deer hunting. Um, and, of course, you know, I didn't go hunting and I didn't play, any, you know, football and I didn't do all of those things that you know, the boys in the neighborhood were supposed to do, especially hunting. Hunting was like, you know, a, a yardstick of when you reached manhood. Saber, meanwhile, to Mubarak's shame and horror, had to call in neighborhood dads to do simple mechanical tasks like unclogging a drain. And Margie was the one who hung their wedding pictures because Saber claimed he didn't know how to hammer a nail. No, Saber didn't do any of that stuff. I mean, Saber was always very formal. He always had a sport jacket. I remember, I remember, um, like, cutting grass was a big deal out there. Like, lawn care, like, how green and how even and how perfect was your yard. And then I remember Saber was in the yard cutting the grass. And he was cutting the grass and he had a sport coat and a tie on. Which is funny, I mean, if you think about it. Well, and why would he do it? I mean, I think, that, I think that came from the Middle East idea that if you are educated, that there's a certain position that you have in society and that you should always look and act a certain way. You can see why, in this atmosphere, Saber at one point panicked and made Margie sign Mubarak up for Little League. To toughen him up, he told her. But mostly, Margie says, Saber worshipped Mubarak. He adored him. Mubarak this, and Mubarak that, and Mubarak the other, and everything he talked about was Mubarak. After he found out Bart was gay, he hardly ever said he wouldn't hardly even mention his name. 
Margie was the one who made the phone call to Mubarak after finding a bunch of gay adult cards in his room. He was 20 years old and staying with friends in Germany at the time on his way to a semester in England. And it was, it was the middle of the night. I don't remember if we were exactly in bed. And the mother came down and said in German to my friend, um, there's a phone call from America and it's an emergency for your American friend. So I was all nervous, and I went upstairs, and it was Margie, and she was crying. She was hysterical. And she said, I said, Margie, what's wrong? And she said, you have to come home now. And I said, why? What's wrong? And she just kept repeating, you have to come home now. And I, I kept trying to get out of her what was wrong. So she finally said, we found a good hospital in Tennessee that can cure you. And then I knew what was wrong. And, of course, I told her that I wasn't coming home until the end of the semester, and I would see her in January, and I think I hung up right away. This was the beginning of their world starting to shift and become something else. Saber blamed Margie for Mubarak being gay. Saber, who never raised his voice before, would pound the table and say Mubarak was gay because he's a mama's boy. I didn't think I'd married the same person at those times. He used to be jolly and gay and cheerful and tell jokes. And I didn't know him anymore. I guess he didn't know me either. He was in such bad shape that he had taken off time from the university. I think he took a whole semester off from teaching at the university. Um, he was so bad at one point, he would sit and, like, stare into space and not respond to c conversations and questions. And they had, like, home health care, like an IV for him at home because he wouldn't eat. When Mubarak came home around Christmas, they all sat down at the kitchen table for a family meeting. Margie didn't say hardly anything the whole time. And neither did I, actually. Saber did most of the talking. And he said, basically, he started with, you know, you're our son and we love you, but this is wrong and this is an illness and there are doctors, you know, I've looked into it and there are doctors who say that if you just try, if you get help, that you can change, you know. Did he say the word homosexual? Oh, God, no, he would never say that. He would say, your condition or your problem, or your situation. He would never say the word gay or homosexual, ever, ever, ever. Like, even in the years after that, he never, ever said that word. The biggest problem with Mubarak being gay was that he would never have children. He would never have a son to carry on the family name, as Saber had done, and as Saber's father had done. This was Mubarak's obligation. After a long argument, the last thing Saber said to Mubarak was this. I remember he said, he looked at me and he said, I will sell all the land in Palestine to raise the money to send you to a doctor if you ever decide that you would go. And that's a, I mean, if you, you know, being Palestinian and understanding how important land is I mean, land is identity, it's a future, it's the past, it's everything. And for Saber to say that he would sell all of his land showed that this was really the top priority in his whole life. For two years, nothing changed. Mubarak stayed in school and kept being gay. Saber stayed depressed and wrote Mubarak long letters saying he loved Mubarak, but Mubarak was sick and he owed it to Saber to get help. Margie quietly began flooding Mubarak's college mailbox with condoms. Then Margie and Saber moved back to the Middle East, as they'd always planned to do when Saber retired. He was 65, she was 59. Six months later, everything shifted again. The family mutated again, becoming more like what it would soon be, and less like it had been before. It started with another phone call to Mubarak. Well, I mean, the way I first found out about it was I got a telephone call one afternoon from Margie. And she said, Honey, 
do you think I could come live with you? And I was, I, I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, Margie, what are you talking about? She said, do you think I could come live with you? And then she told me that she and Saber were getting divorced because he was going to marry another woman and have another son. In fact, divorce wasn't even what Saber wanted. At first, he asked Margie if she would be his partner in what he called joint venture. I want you to help me find a young lady you think you can get along with. I said, what? And he said, I want to marry another woman and have a baby. I said, okay, Sauber, you better find one you think you can get along with because I'm not going to be here. And then, you know, she went through the, that was plan A and the plan B was having another wife at a different apartment. And then plan C was him getting married in the West Bank, just going down there a couple weeks a year, and then basically living with Margie and Jordan. And her response to that was always my favorite. That's when she asked him. She said, okay, that's fine, as long as I can have a boyfriend. He said, why? I said, <laughs> so when you tell, ask me what I've been doing, I'll tell you the same thing you've been doing while you were over there. <laughs> He didn't appreciate that either. And I remember Saber wrote me a very, very long letter explaining what he was doing and why he was doing it and how he had been forced into doing this because for years he had been asking me to go get help and I was just ignoring him. And he felt that it was his, since I was not going to have a son to carry on the family name, that the responsibility of making sure that the family, family name survived suddenly became his again, and this was the only way he could see to do it. And he was very heavy on the, this is your fault, you're doing this to Margie, not me. The other thing that was really strange was he spent pages saying, you know, try to, con your mother is being very closed minded about all of this. Try to convince, try to help me convince her to stay here. She doesn't have to leave. I don't want her to leave. So Saber divorced Margie, telling her every day until she left that he loved her and didn't want her to leave. And she got on the plane and began the life she's pretty much living now. From that point on, instead of a husband, she would have a son. And from the moment the plane touched down, he treated her the way you'd want your husband to treat you. I'll never forget when I came back getting off the plane. You know, we got through customs and all that stuff. I saw this great big bunch of flowers somebody was holding way up in that beautiful, beautiful bunch of flowers. And I said, somebody is certainly going to get to myself beautiful bouquet of flowers and guess who that was well any guesses margie moved into mubarak's graduate school apartment which by the way was at the same university where saber had taught in her old life she'd been supported by one man her husband the professor in her new life she was surrounded by a whole sissy entourage mubarak's friends were always coming in and whisking her away to the orchestra to plays they adored her. She still cried every day, many times a day, for the first few months. And every day she got at least one letter from Saber, sometimes two. Finally, one day the letter that came from Saber said he'd gotten married. Mubarak, not knowing what was in the letter, gave it to Margie and went to his room. We came back out, I mean, it was five or ten minutes later, and she was still sitting there, but she had a funny look on her face. So I said... Are you okay? And she started saying things like, Please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me, and crying. I'm like, Margie, what are you talking about? Don't come any closer, don't come any closer, don't hurt me. And she, she didn't know who I was. She didn't know who she was. I just went out of it. Her amnesia, Mubarak calls it a vacation from the bad news, lasted several days. One, two, three. There you go. 
We're in Margie's cardiologist's office, and she's about to surprise me. On the last day I spend with Margie and Mubarak, she suddenly murmurs that she wishes Mubarak had gotten married. Who I wish you would have married. You wish Mubarak would have married? Mm-hmm. Who? Mark Stoner. Now, most mothers who say, oh, I wish my gay son had gotten married, and you ask them who, they don't say a man. <laughs> there is oh, a Mark Stoner. So you don't wish Mubarak had married any girl that you know? Mm-mm. I wish he'd have married Mark Stoner. Because he was a nice guy, and he loved Mubarak a lot. Even after all the time I'd spent with her, I had completely expected her to say a woman's name. Because even though it's common when men come out as gay for their mothers to be more accepting than their fathers, there are usually at least some pretty clear limits for the mothers, too. Certain ways that they're used to seeing the world and just can't give up. But Margie's world and Mubarak's are not really separate, as they are for most gay people and their parents. Mubarak is really glad she's here. He says it all the time. And he spends a lot of time with Margie. Willingly. Happily. He's the only person I know who seems as unambivalent in his love for his mother as she is in her love for him. Every once in a while he talks about something I know he thinks about a lot, which is that this is the end of Margie's life, and he's grateful that she's spending it here, where he can be with her. Okay. Margie? Mm-hmm. Are you okay? Mm-hmm. You're, you're like wobbling back and forth. Mm-hmm. Margie? Margie? Margie, talk to me. What is it, Margie? What's happening? While I was Look taping, Margie had what seemed to be a small stroke. Margie? 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 Do you want me to call 911, Mubarak? It all happened yeah. in about two minutes. Yeah. And when it was over, Margie seemed fine, although disoriented and tired. She couldn't really remember what had happened. We were more shaken than she was. Mubarak and I talked in the kitchen afterward while he made Margie some tea. It was really scary. It was so frightening. Because, you know, it's so scary when you go to the hospital. And shes I remember the first time I went, and she had congestive heart failure. And you you don't know what that means. You know, you hear heart failure, and you panic. And then I remembered the other two times going into the hospital and thinking it should be easier this time. But every time it happens, it gets scarier because you think you're one step closer to something really awful happening. I'm going to be a mess whenever anything really serious happens. just did that because we knew you are going to be tape recording today. <laughs> I'm like, Margie, you can have a little heart failure this afternoon. <laughs> just, just do what you can. I mean... <clears throat> I'm so scared all the time. Anyway. P.S. It might not be clear from this story, but I think Margie really loved Saber. I think he really loved her. We saw it clear as day in the pages of her wedding scrapbook. She turns to a picture from her wedding day. Sabra's embracing Margie, and both their eyes are closed. They're smiling. They look completely happy, probably not even aware the picture is being taken. What were you thinking right at that moment when that was happening? I got that man. (laughs) He's mine now. My mother had told me, when you find the right one, you know it. And I did. Well, I thought he was the right one. Turned out he wasn't. I never did find the right one. (laughs) All the pain of loving Oh, the misery I go through Never knowing what to do 
all the pain of loving you. You just can't stand to see Act me. Two. Instructions for Sissies. Well, I'm joined here in the studio right now by John Connors, who often provides music for our program and also performs around Chicago. And um, and you've brought in a book with you. The name of the book is? How to Improve Your Personality. It's written in huge black letters on the cover. Well, it's it's a black cover with white and, and sort of this, um, would you call that a daisy yellow? Yes. A daisy yellow. I would. And it was funny because uh, walking down Lincoln Avenue... <laughs> It's really funny how <laughs> people sort of look at you in this odd way when you're carrying a book on how to improve your personality, and immediately you're suspect, and <laughs> they wonder what's wrong. <laughs> but and then and then like I, of course, you know, turn the book so no one can read it. So I'm thinking I'm so insecure with my personality <laughs> that I don't want people to think that there's something wrong. All right, and this book has an important lesson for us for our program today, on our theme today. And um, wh- why, don't, why don't you just open it up and read? This is from the chapter, Good Appearance, Grooming, from the section, Other Appearance Factors in Men. Copyright? Uh, copyright 1942, reprint 1954. If your physique, complexion, voice, speech, habits, carriage, or general behavior in the slightest degree suggest a femininity, do everything in your power to create an impression of masculinity. Pitch your voice lower. Develop your arm muscles and your chest expansion. Avoid pet expressions and exclamations commonly used by women. See that your posture and walk are masculine. Hold up your shoulders, throw out your chest, take longer steps, think masculine, and act masculine. Here's a list of gestures commonly associated with women, and another list commonly associated with men. If you use any of the feminine gestures, stop at once and substitute the corresponding masculine gesture. You'll have to watch yourself pretty closely on this one. Feminine gesture, hand on hip. Masculine gesture, hands folded over chest or clasped in back. Feminine gesture, tapping front teeth with finger nail. Masculine gesture, clenched fist under chin or jaw. Feminine gesture, looking at people from the corner of eyes. Masculine gesture, direct look, entire head turned toward person. Feminine gesture, putting one hand up to the back to touch hair. Masculine gesture, clenching fingers of both hands together firmly at the back of head. How do you laugh? Are your laughs pitched high like a woman's? Ha 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 Lower the pitch. Develop a masculine laugh. Chuckle. Laugh from the depths of your chest and stomach. Ha 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 ha! Roar! Bellow! Do anything but giggle. Don't be guilty of a high hysterical laugh. Listen to Edward Arnold and Clark Gable in the movies. Imitate their laughter. You can't do it, but you can at least try. Hey, John. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine a gay man in 1942 actually reading this oh and my trying God. to follow yeah, these instructions? Course. You can? I mean, like, I could see people taking notes. Well, I mean, self-help books are still the same. And I mean, I... I but 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 okay. But but when you picture this guy in 1942 reading this book, this effeminate guy reading the book, and and thinking like, okay, okay, I got to do that. Okay, where is he? And and who is he? Um. Well, he's probably still living at home. Probably, you know, the unmarried 30-year-old, who uh, his last ditch effort is to uh, prove to everyone 
that he's not the sissy that everyone thinks he is, and that there must be a formula for it. I picture I picture this guy. Okay, let's call him um, Benton, and he's in <laughs> his bedroom at his parents' house, and he has he has remodeled since he was a kid. And um, okay, it's 1942. Is he 4F? Is he going to go to the war? Has he been to the war? If you're putting the war factor into this, I mean, you have maybe you have somebody who's in their early 20s who can't get into the war because he is so effeminate. I don't know. I mean, I've seen documentaries of gay men in World War II, and I think there probably came a point when actually they had to take pretty much everybody. And there were the famous gay battalions. Exactly. Were that they? went into France first. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were the only ones who could speak French. <laughs> And then they gave a battalion. Exactly. And, and the raided, raided the lingerie shops and redesigned <laughs> all the clothes. It's just and just redecorated the whole place. In the country. <laughs> so the Germans didn't want it anymore because it was just too fuffy for them. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be staying here. It's far too fuffy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, John Connors, coming up. More sissies in the house. Dan Savage, many people without clenched fists under their jaw. That's all in a minute when our program continues. It's This American Life from Ira Glass. Each week on our program, of course, we choose some theme, we bring you documentaries, monologues, overheard conversations, found tape, found text, anything we can think of on that theme. Today's program, Sissies, we've arrived at Act 3 of our program, The Pansy Kings Sing Songs of Love, and we've arrived at this question. Why do sissies freak people out so much? What is the big deal anyway? I would argue that um, there are two things going on with sissies. First of all, there's the idea that they're weak, right? And since everybody is, at one point or another oh. in their life, feared being seen as weak, it can be painful to see somebody else who seems weak. Second, there's the fact that they cross gender lines. Sissies do. These are boys who act like girls. Or that's the stereotype, anyway. Well, this next story is about a sissy who got rid of half of that formula. He got rid of the appearing weak part of it. And by doing that, he was able to get away with crossing gender lines and acting more androgynous. This is the story of Dave All, a man who these days embraces his sissiness. But embraces isn't even, <laughs> isn't even big enough for his relationship to his sissiness. He's, he's a guy who founded uh, something called the Pansy Kings, gay and sissy performers who do a show they call the Pansy King Cotillion here in Chicago. But back in Peoria, where he grew up, he was not so happy being a sissy. I got my leg broken in PE class uh, for wrestling. Instead of matching people with people who were of their same strength, they would match you with a guy who was of your same weight. Well, of course, I was this really fat kid, really, really heavy, overweight kid. And the other guy who weighed the same of me was a sheet of beef. He was this big simian hulk of a guy. And the P.E. teacher, um, perhaps out of cluelessness, but also I think there was some malice toward the pansy kid and wanting to see the pansy kid get messed over, uh, he has me wrestle the brute. So it's me and the brute out there on the mat. And of course, within 30 seconds, I'm lying on the mat and my leg is in two pieces. And I just remember that I was sort of moaning and crying, Oh dear, oh dear, oh my, oh my, which, you know, had to be one of the, the great uh, 
probably the most Blanche Dubois-like moment of my young life. Uh, as I was carried out on the stretcher crying, oh dear, oh my, oh my, oh dear. <laughs> I got a lot of abuse, especially in PE class, because I was bad at sports, and obviously that was important to the other kids, and they didn't want to have me on their team. I got a lot of insults in the hallway, or people knocking my books out of my hands, or whatever. And what happened is I, I started to develop a persona. And uh, my best friend at that time was a girl who went to another high school named Lydia. And she was very punk. She was the punk rock girl. And uh, what I did is, naturally, I started changing my look. And I got the very first spiky punk haircut ever seen in East Peoria. And the effect that this had was really strange because I went from being overtly and aggressively mocked to being really sort of given a wide berth. Um, I went from being mocked to almost being feared because suddenly I was turning up at school with this weird spiky haircut wearing these uh, baggy yellow trousers a la madness and like vintage green suit jackets. And you got to understand that at my high school, to walk down the hallways, it looked like a lover boy video. There's this very specific uniform that consisted of a really ugly flannel shirt, a black T-shirt under it that could say one of five things, uh, and only these five things, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, REO Speedwagon, Jack Daniels, or Harley Davidson. And you could not deviate from that palette. Well... So I turn up dressed like a, a refugee from a, a Madness video or a David Bowie album cover. And to them, I, I just, to, to come to school looking like that, I must be capable of anything. I uh, had a friend tell me he had overheard these two senior burnout girls talking. And one of them said something like, that Dave All, he's crazy. He'd jump in front of a bus if you told him to. He looks like he could kill somebody. There was nothing further from the truth. I mean, I was probably the only kid in that school who would never have taken a pill my mother didn't give me. And frankly, I was awfully cowed by authority. But suddenly I had this look. You were still a sissy. Uh-huh. I was, I was still a sissy, but I was a different kind of sissy. Because what the punk new wave aesthetic allowed you to do was be androgynous in a way that was also kind of tough. You had this maybe dyed funny hair, but you also had a safety pin through your ear and you were maybe wearing eyeliner but you were also wearing ripped jeans and a black biker jacket so what it did is it confused them because it was sending all of these mixed signals um, a I signal call it, of violence at the same time as a signal of well, something else well at least a signal of don't mess with me I can take care of myself and I'm not afraid of you I call it the, the squid strategy you muddy the waters as an act of defense you shoot out a lot of ink into the water and confuse them and suddenly they don't know where to strike because suddenly they didn't think I looked like what they meant by a faggot anymore which is someone who's really pathetic and weak because I also looked kind of tough and strange and yet there were these androgynous elements and the result is that they just started leaving me alone I didn't get called a faggot anymore in the hallway I didn't really get called anything and what I discovered was that while I would never have chosen to be feared on my own once there I realized that it was a lot better than being mocked. The problem is, I was still not dealing with the internalized sissy phobia because I was allowed to be androgynous. I was allowed to wear makeup or, you know, wear earrings or wear, you know, big flowery paisley shirts only to the extent that I had this cover of also having the safety pin in the ear or the ripped jeans or the spiky hair or whatever looked tough. And it wasn't until college or a little after that I realized the real challenge was to be able to simply go out there like a drag queen does, you know, without any of those balancing affectations of masculinity or toughness, um, to really be a sissy, you know, and go out there only only using the persona elements that are considered to be a feminine was something I was still very afraid to do. 
It's interesting that um, that you were able to accept the fact that you were gay long before you were able to accept the fact that you were a sissy. I think that's really telling about which prejudice is almost more deeply rooted. I think, I think a lot of homophobia comes from its association with sissiness because the sissiness, the breaking of those sacred gender categories, is the deeper phobia in our culture. It would be much easier for me to walk down the What's street. Up, guys? carrying a copy of The Joy of Gay Sex openly than it would be to walk down the street in a pair of sparkly ruby red high heels. You know, in this city, in this urban environment, um, I think I'm capable of doing both. But which one would I feel a little bit more inner self-consciousness or anxiety about doing? Uh, it would be breaking the sissy barrier. Dave Ault is the founder of the Pansy Kings Performance Collective and the host of the Partly Dave Show, a cabaret variety show here in Chicago. Lightning our love to an armored car that was hit by an ice cream truck. Oh, my baby's got the hands of gold and I'm melting into who knows what. He rides a girl's bike. He rides a girl's bike. He rides away. He rides a girl's bike. He rides a girl's bike. He rides a girl's He rides away. Yeah, oh yeah. Act four. The other love. The dare not speak its name. The love that we're talking about in this act is the love of sissies. Dan Savage is a writer and editor at The Stranger, a weekly paper in Seattle, and author of the syndicated sex advice column Savage Love. Dan Savage says that he's met hundreds of gay men, thousands, enough that he can state definitively that most of them do not act like sissies, which he says is a shame for him because he loves sissies. My boyfriend is kind of a sissy. He hates it when I mention it, and when he finds out I said it on national public radio, he's going to kill me. But he is kind of a sissy. He cooks, he likes to do laundry, he's into fashion and Britpop and Barbara Streisand, and all that's okay with me. I hate to cook. And if he wants to listen to Funny Girl while he folds my shirts, well, I can deal. And besides, it's really no sacrifice on my part. I think sissies are sexy. Though sissy isn't the right word, really. Little boys who play with dolls are sissies. Grown men who went to see The Mirror Has Two Faces on the morning it opened, and loved it, are known in gay slang at least as femmes. My attraction to Femi guys is rooted, I have no doubt, in a, a high school experience. At St. Gregory the Great, where I spent my sophomore year, there was this senior, totally Femi and gay and out of the closet, and this was in 1979. He dressed in Kmart disco fashions and wore his hair long and used eyeliner. St. Greg's was a dumping ground. All the kids kicked out of other Catholic high schools for being bad students or hoodlums wound up at Greg's. These were not kids who instinctively honored diversity. These were kids who beat up sissies. But no pounding could stop St. Greg's only femme. Like Gandhi, he'd be back the day after a beating, defiant in his satin pants, with his hair feathered back like Farrah Fawcett's. No punch, no put-down could stop him from talking loudly in the cafeteria about the bars he went to, the men he dated, the trouble he'd seen. He was very femmy, but he didn't want to be a woman. He liked being a guy, and he liked being gay, and he liked everyone to know about it. As a miserably closeted 14-year-old sophomore, I desperately wanted to go to gay bars and satin pants. I wanted to date men. I wanted to see some trouble. But I wasn't brave enough or strong enough or courageous enough. This Femi senior, he was all those butch things. He displayed more courage when he walked into St. Greg's every morning than I've ever displayed in my life. Which is why I had such a crush on him, I think. Of all the tough kids at St. Greg's, he was absolutely the toughest. Which brings me, in a rather roundabout fashion, to the personal ads. Being attracted to femmes and willing to admit it makes me something of a rarity among gay men, judging from gay personal ads. No one seems to like femme guys much. 
In the Personals in the Village Voice, the Chicago Reader, and the SF Weekly, almost every other boy seeking a boy winds up his ad with no fats, no femmes, or the truly appalling straight acting, straight appearing. What is up with that? I don't have a problem with no fats, no femmes. That's just blunt. But straight acting and appearing, what does that mean exactly? Straight acting and appearing guys don't read gay personal ads, do they? Reading gay personals is a very gay acting thing to do, and responding to gay personals is a very, very, very gay acting thing to do. Practically the gayest action a man can take short of having gay sex or owning the soundtrack to Yentl. When a person, a gay person, puts straight acting, straight appearing in his ad, and mind you, it's only in about one out of ten ads, he's saying that gayness in and of itself is unattractive, undesirable. A few years ago, The Stranger, the paper I work for in Seattle, launched a personal section. Being the sex guy at the paper, the personals became my responsibility. I ran the section and got to decide what was and was not kosher. And the first thing I absolutely forbid was straight acting, straight appearing. Some of my straight acting and appearing co-workers, who were also actually straight, objected. Nothing else was banned in our freewheeling personal section. Deleting straight acting reeked of PC censorship. After pitching a hissy fit at a staff meeting, a very gay acting thing to do, by the way, I got my way. We wouldn't run ads from a black woman seeking white acting black men, I remember shouting. Or Jewish guys seeking Christian appearing Jewish women, would we? Most of my straight appearing coworkers saw my point, and the rest were willing to let the lone sissy on staff make the call about what was, I told them, a gay thing. As a result, The Stranger is, so far as I know, the only paper in the country, gay or straight, that will not allow gay men to advertise themselves as straight acting, straight appearing. Not that something hasn't taken its place, something has, a monster of my own creation. You see, at first, if someone sent in a straight acting ad, we'd run the ad just without the phrase. But sometimes dropping the phrase left a hole in the ad, so we would very occasionally substitute the word masculine for the phrase straight acting, straight appearing. The word caught on, and now it's in almost every ad in the Boy Seeking Boy section of the Stranger Personals. What you don't see much of in the personals are men looking for femi guys. And ads placed by guys who admit to being femi are the rarest of the rare, since admitting to being femme has all the allure of admitting to being a fat slob. Here's an interesting one. Black male, secure, straight acting, in the closet, femme, seeking boyfriend. Wow. Coming across this ad made me feel like a bird watcher who just spotted some rare tropical parrot up in the Arctic Circle. A straight acting femme. How do you pull that off? And here's another ad from a guy who risked describing himself as femi. Gay white male, 5'9", 150 pounds, HIV negative, attractive, mildly feminine, seeks relationship with gay male around six foot. I decided to give him a call. His name is Mark. When you say feminine, what are you trying to tell people who read your personal about you? Uh, um, I'm not masculine. I'm not straight acting. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to clarify that because it sickens me when I read a personal ad and it says I'm straight acting. Why does that bother you? Um, because it seems really self-hating, and I'd rather not def define myself in terms of the straight culture. Have you encountered guys who uh, didn't like the fact that you were mildly feminine, or guys who wouldn't date you, or had negative experiences with guys who freaked out because, you know, you listened to Barbara Streisand or something? <laughs> I don't know if I would say I've had negative experiences, but I definitely think that, well... I'll say that a friend of mine recently um, said that he thought that I would get more dates if I had a deeper voice. What, what does he want you to do? He wants you to talk like this into the yeah. phone? he wants me to talk like this all the time. You know, and... And th that doesn't sound like it would be you. It doesn't sound like you'd be comfortable doing that. No. But you, he thinks that you'll get more dates if you do that. Correct. Do you think you'll get more dates if you pretend to be butcher than you actually are? Well, I think that in the gay community, it's something, especially right now, that is desired, uh -huh. um, unfortunately. Finally, I decided to call a couple of guys who took out personal ads describing themselves as straight acting and appearing. 
I really wanted to know what they thought they were doing when they wrote that down. What they thought it meant to be a straight-acting gay man. Here's one. Bodybuilders. Let me check you out, tease you, and please you. You be daring closet type. I'm straight-acting closet bi. 30-something attractive. I'd never spoken to a straight-acting closet bisexual before. I gave him a call. What's straight-acting mean? Well, definitely not, uh, you know, like... Uh, in the gay scene at all, uh -huh. you know, straight acting. I just, uh, you know, I, you know, I go out with women. Uh, I have girlfriends occasionally, and you know, and, and I don't think any of my friends would suspect that I have like uh, <laughs> gay sex on the side. Uh huh. Uh huh. What if a really um, sexy looking guy who looked really butch and really masculine answered your ad, but he was, you know, he had a lisp and he was a little effeminate? Uh huh. At what point do you draw the line and say you're too effeminate for me? It would be hard to to tell you exactly what where I would draw the line because it, it's all such a personal thing, you know. First impressions uh, when you talk to somebody, when you and then when you meet them, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So if a gay guy who was feminine but could act butch were to respond to your ad, you might think of going out with him so long as the whole time you were together, he could keep it up, he could keep acting sort of straight and appearing straight. Even if he went home and put on, you know, ladies' underwear and listened to Vicky Carr and cried? That'd be perfect. You'd be okay with that? Yeah. Is fear of the consequences of coming up maybe what part of what keeps you from being out with everybody? Definitely. And what are you afraid might happen? Well, I don't want to freak out all my friends, for one thing, you know. Because some of my friends are really pretty um, bigoted? conservative. Bigoted, yeah, exactly. So how does it feel to, I mean, aren't you kind of lying to them? Aren't you like a black person whose best friend is a blind white person who hates black people? Well, I never thought of it that way. I'm not sure I'd agree. You know, I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm a silent person when, you know, when things are said and criticisms are made. I saved this next interview for last because of all the guys who place straight acting personal ads, the saddest to my mind are the out gay guys who in every other way sound pretty together except that they describe themselves as straight. Robert's ad reads, Seeking companion of about my age, I am professional, medium build, 37 years old, 6'2", 220 pounds, straight acting. Looking for a guy for discreet excitement, friendship, and fun. When you say you're straight acting, what do you mean? Oh, I just mean that it's, uh, it doesn't fit the uh, traditional stereotype. That you don't? Yeah. What is the traditional stereotype? You describe yourself as a gay man, yeah? Right. But what's the traditional stereotype that you think you don't fit of gay men? Kind of effeminate. Uh-huh. What kind of guy are you looking for? Uh, just kind of a regular person like I think that I am. You know, I work every day and play hard and, uh... Uh, just kind of lead a pretty quiet life, and I'm not, like, looking for someone who is, you know, doing the... The bar thing every the night. The bar thing, yeah. And kind of being burnt out and being promiscuous and things like that. What do, you, what do you think when you see, like, a really effeminate gay man, like, out in public being really effeminate? Well, I just think, what, what does he do for a living? You know, if I see him at night, I, you know, I think it's really fun... And if I see the person during the day, I'm wondering, well, does he have a job? Uh huh. <laughs> and, you know, what does people at work think? Right. You know, being a minority, being a member of a minority group, uh, a racial minority, I think that uh, uh, it's really, you know, I'm, I'm just one who are a lot more conservative. And I think that when you label yourself, you just make, you, you make it a lot more difficult. When you were when you were a little boy, yeah. were you a sissy? Yeah, I mean, I, my voice didn't uh, mature uh, fast enough for me. Um, were you picked on? Uh, yeah. Do you think that that uh, that being picked on has any had any impact on your adult choices around being very very private? Uh yes, I, I do, I do. You want to stay inside of the box, and being inside of the of the male box, then people are not going to pick on you. People are not going to do uh, mean things and say horrible things about you, as long as you stay within inside a realm of acceptable behavior. So, part of what keeps you inside that realm of acceptable behavior then is is fear. 
of being picked on or being, uh, you know, labeled or labeled or a victim of, you know, anti-gay violence or, but it's fear then, right. at least partially. Yeah. So in a way, when you see someone like really swishy on the street, isn't that brave of them? Uh, not always. Uh, you know, it depends on where the person's coming from. I, you know, I don't think that if you're swishy and then you happen to be end up in a ghetto of other gay men, then you're free to do that. But I don't think that you're exceptionally brave. I just think that you, you know you live in a very uh, uh, violent world, and things happen, and you try not to put yourself into a situation that bad things can happen to you. I don't agree with Robert. The way I see it, the bravest of all the guys I talked to was Mark, the guy who described himself as feminine in his personal ad. Mark and that brave, swishy senior I had a crush on at St. Greg's, they both have the courage to present their real selves to the world and all their glorious sissiness, which in a world that despises feminine men and boys is a risky thing to do, a brave thing to do. Now contrast their behavior with that of men who are straight acting 100% discreet and in the closet, or men who are constantly policing their own behavior. These are men ruled by fear. Fear of discovery, fear of femininity, fear of what it means to be who they are. They are the sissies. I'm not saying that the closet case who asked gay men not to respond to his ad needs to be a big swishy queen in order to be true to himself. He just needs to be a man. Secure about who he is, a man who isn't ruled by fear, a man willing to show himself to the world. He needs to not be such a sissy. Dan Savage, he's the editor at The Stranger, and he has a book coming out in September called The Commitment. Oh, my man, I love him so. He'll never know. All my life is just despair. But I don't care. Well, today's program was produced by Nancy Updike and myself, Peter Clowney, Elise Spiegel, and special guest producer Danny Miller, contributing editors Paul Tuff, Jack Hitt, and Margie Rockland. Special thanks to the Aluminum Group for original musical scoring underneath our first story and underneath Dave All's story. Thanks to KUOW in Seattle, to Al Ravitz and Mr. John Connors, and very special thanks to Mubarak and Margie for letting us, our program, and Nancy Updike into their lives. In the years since we first broadcast our story... Margie passed away in 1998 with Mubarak at her side, holding her hand and talking to her in the hospital when she had her final stroke. Mubarak is currently the editor of the Express Gay News, the gay and lesbian newspaper in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Margie, I, um, I do a pretty good imitation of you. <laughs> this, is, this is what I was telling Mubarak. So, so this is, um, okay, now I'm imitating myself, asking you a question. Mm -hmm. so, um, so Margie, you said that, and did, what did Saber say? Nothing. <laughs> He just looked at me. <laughs> is that pretty good? <laughs> That's real good. It's good. <laughs> this American Life is distributed by Public Radio International. Support for This American Life comes from Volkswagen of America and the Phaeton. It's got four-motion all-wheel drive, an adjustable air suspension, and 335-horsepower V8 engine, all standard. Apparently there are a few wonders out there that have yet to cease. Read more about the Phaeton at VW.com. Our website, www.thisamericanlife.org, where you can listen to our programs for absolutely free. Well, you know, you can download episodes of our program at audible.com slash thisamericanlife. WBEZ Management Oversight for our program by Mr. Tori Malati, who explains, no, 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 he does not laugh like this. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. I'm Ira Glass. Back next week with more stories of This American Life. We won't be staying here. It's far too fluffy. <laughs> for whatever my man is, I am his Forever PRI Public Radio International.